Hello, hello. This is Johannes Watery from Hold to Run. Today, we will modify our client device code so that it can receive new credentials from a configuration server, which in my case is Firebase. So we'll take a look how the user credentials are saved as key values in Firebase and what is needed in the client device to receive new creden credentials. And then with those credentials, which were safely injected into client device, we will have an authentication access into our application API server, which will then respond JSON with token, which we can save and maintain an actual API access into the application data, which these client devices will need. So this way we'll have, let's say, more secure way to upkeep our credentials if, for instance, any reason we need to change them. We are able to release them from the configuration server and also this way we never need to statically type those credentials into the client application code which could be breached by some advanced users and this way also if we ever need to change our actual application server credentials for client access we will be able to use those new credentials because we can always release updated credentials from the configuration server. Okay. I consider this the current state of the art of dealing with credentials into client devices and accessing into the application API with an authentication and JSON that token. So that's the current state how I establish mobile applications into production and establish the backend server. If you have any better uh, systematic way to handle these, I'd be happy to hear your comments. But hey, let's start from the Firebase. Okay, let's start from the Firebase console. So if you're not familiar with the Firebase, so that's a service backend service provided by Google and some of the features are free to use if you are Android developer. Okay, so one of the key features that I've learned to use is remote config. In here, you can see currently two key values, so-called password key and username key. These are the credentials that we can now inject online into all clients of who are using this app. So this way we have a method to manage changing credentials if for any reason they would need to be changed into all client devices. This way also we don't need to release a new app version with the statically typed user credentials. So it is more secure way to deal and manage such a delicate items. Okay, remember the keywords. We will now go into Android code and ensure our Firebase is set up and we can receive these in the runtime code of the application. Okay, first of all, to work with Firebase, you need to have Google's dependencies for the Firebase. So pretty much with these, you can work with the remote configuration and multiple other features. But just to show you if you're not familiar about the dependencies required for Firebase. The second thing is that Firebase has to be initialized as early as possible. 
So application class is correct place. So application class is something that the manifest initializes as soon as possible. So application class is tagged in the manifest Android name and application dot then your application name, whatever it is. This has to be the place to call application class. So in application class, you just say Firebase app dot initialize app. After that, you'll have an access into the singleton of the Firebase instance. In our custom remote configuration object, we are holding these key values, keys to assign what the Firebase need to get from the remote configuration and then we can also define how, how often. And in here we have variables for the username and password but as you can see I'm not writing any values into these. I'm just assigning the exact same key values that are currently existing in the Firebase remote configuration uh, server in here and assigning these empty values for further use. These are so-called default values and now let's say our app would get reverse engineered and some advanced users they could just open this object and get an access into my credentials but not anymore. At least it became way more difficult because the only time, time the app gets those is when it, it gets injected the new values from the remote configuration server and they are embedded into the app system way deeper that at least I'm not even aware how they are stored into the app currently. So way more difficult to get an access into those credentials other than just coming in here and getting an access that into statically typed string values which are open to read for any user. So this is more secure. So we have to set the Firebase configuration. So you can always get your remote config via Firebase remote config get instance. You have to then define how often it gets refreshed. 12 hours is pretty good and you apply into your Firebase instance your configuration settings for uh, cyclic updates, your default values which will also hold the keys into your remote configuration server values and you just say fetch and activate and you can log the result if they are working. Nothing else to do in here, at least on my code. Call this Firebase set Firebase config method in your main activity on create so that it gets set up immediately on the landing activity, main activity of the app. In addition, you can activate new values as much as possible. So I always use this activate new values with rem Firebase remote config instance and just call activate new values. And again, I, the only thing I'm doing logging if it's success or not. Call this in the on start method of your main activity. So this gets called multiple times. It just ensures that when you have refreshed data, let's say in a cycle of 12 hours, you also activate those into the Firebase instance. When you need to query those values, you'll get the new values inst instead of the old values. Okay. And now we want to use these. Okay, that's the next step. So pretty much where we are now is that we have a remote configuration server with username and password. 
in principle our client device has capability to receive these but it doesn't yet use those i don't use those yet in the code and i don't make any authentication attempts or api calls with those yet so we need to modify now the uh, retrofit api code just a little bit to ensure that it can handle authentication with the most up-to-date token and auth authentication data so let's take a look at that one currently before or when we update let's say privacy policy related uri data which is here as a button it sends me into the app privacy policy page but this gets updated cyclically so that if for any reason web page is changed or updated or the uri is changed i have a chance to update that data into the clients so that's kind of a most basic use case for backend api ask the most up-to-date data for uris whatever application might hold pretty much these are non-user related datas at this point but now we have to modify this kind of a setup which only was a static http client and it needs to be a bit more dynamic to also include authentication and json web token handling and of course a way to fetch those firebase remote config uh, uh, username and password so we pretty much need to delete this one at this point so i need to check if i can use anything or if i need to delete everything and i might just at this point do like this let's take them off and we will not use api key anymore because this is gonna be based on dynamic json web token so let's see how we did that in our other applications we have similar method to provide server api this time our client will also include authentication interceptor and authenticator interceptor so we will have two custom classes which will do the work for us when we try to make an api data access into the server so let's take these from here because i know they are already correct they won't contain mistakes so i want to uh, copy paste that and then we'll, we'll we'll see what they are doing in the code we are missing some basic code for instance we need to add prefs data store methods to make the json web token persisted and we will need to see where did i call this before here okay let's make the method name same in here okay so what is happening in here pretty much I'm updating privacy policy related data in the on start method identically as I'm activating new remote configuration values so this gets updated also at each 12 hours just to ensure clients have the most up-to-date URIs related to the privacy policies okay we are creating retrofit an OK HTTP client in here pretty much retrofit builder with converter factory JSON converter factory create 
we are telling that there will be base or URI domain. This is my backend base domain HTTPS etc 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 dot com. So you have to come up with your own domain. We will then create JSON web token client. Just, uh, this will just refer into my custom uh, function. In function we'll have timeouts for the call and overall call read connection follow redirects, follow SSL redirects. And then we come to the most important things to ensure that the authentication will work. We have to code and add authentication interceptor. So this will ensure that it includes the JSON web token always into the call and into the correct header into the aut authorization header. The name has to be authorization header. So we have to add that in, in there and make it a bearer and then the token name. So what this pretty much does, it intercepts the chain and we will fetch the most latest token that is saved into our preferences data store as a persistent data in our app. We will fetch the token. We will make a request new builder from the chain request new builder that we get from the override function while this gets intercepted. And we say chain add header request add header. This is called authorization header. And we have to add a pair space and the token that we just fetched from the pref prefs data store. This way, this is always added into our API calls. This is going to be a REST API call into a backend. Okay. Then just we say return this response chain dot proceed request build. And this is modifying on the go our REST API uh, uh, method inside the retrofit framework. Okay. And as a second interceptor in the client, we have to code out, out authenticator interceptor. So the first interceptor ha will ha always handle the token, include that one if it exists. Though nevertheless, if the token request into the API fails, that's obvious case that we might need to uh, re-log in again with our latest username and password. So for that one, we have to add authenticator interceptor. Okay, so we have another inner class that we will use for that one. So what this pretty much does, if the client call fails into our API, the server should return 401 in case of the token wasn't valid or it was outdated. So what this out authenticator interceptor class will do, it will call this override function. And when we get this called, we can then revert back into our server. And instead of trying to make a call into the data specific API endpoint, we have to now make a call in to our login URI endpoint with our latest username and password to get a new validated login and to get a new valid JSON web token from the server. So this will always intercept 401 unauthorized response from a server. Okay, so what is happening in here? When this gets called, this will be the first place 
and if I recall the only place that we need to ask those username and password from our remote configuration framework of Firebase. So we get access now into our username and password with our key values. So okay, of course, we need the remote config instance. I have created in my custom object of remote config a function which just returns me Firebase remote config get instance the singleton instance of this Firebase framework. Okay. So with this one, we can get access into our username value by using get string and then inserting that username key. So again, I'm using my object remote config and I'm just telling that, hey, give me the value of this key. And we can then insert that into our data class and we just do the same to get the password. And we just use our password key in here. And as you can see, these never get any static value string values in here. Now those username, credentials, passwords are embedded inside of the Fire, Firebase remote config framework. Way harder to get access into. You cannot just read a code to get those values. Okay. So we have a data class which just holds username and a password because we need to create a an object and with this object we have to make a post login call and add these credentials into the request body of that post call. So we now have a user credentials object and hopefully our remote configuration has fetched us the most latest data and with this we can make post out. So now the post out will make a call into our login endpoint. Now you have to come up in your server you have your data point data request access endpoints, but of course there needs to be a login access endpoint. I can show you the Ktor endpoint of my login while, while we're going further and further. And inside we pass in that user credential object. Okay, so post out in retrofit looks like this. We just give it the endpoint URI and the request body of user credentials. So this way we get to log in with correct credentials. Okay, now we have our response for that post made. Now, and we just need to check if it was success. It's gonna pretty much give us response and some body. Okay, we get the body, we check was the response successful, if it's successful and the body isn't null, then our call, let's say the intercepted call due to unauthorized access was reverted into a login call and now it was finally success. And now we need to save the JSON web token that the server fed us back inside the response body. So when we log in via JSON web token logging method, the server has to give us now that JSON web token in the response body. Okay, so it should be in here. We consume the response body with dot string call. And here we go. We have the new token value. Now we want to save it. So we have to add our prefs data store to save that token into. So we want to make this persistent because the token doesn't necessarily 
get old in a minute or in a 30 second it might have a lifetime of a week or a month or day so we want to continue making our api calls with that token as long as it is valid and if it if it's not then our authentication interceptor will renew that via login method automatically so let's add these couple of missing methods after i have done reading this one so now we have to create new client when this is success so we say response request new builder we add header out header always it has to be added into the authorization header like so i've named it just a a variable out header but it is actually authorization header which is a standard header name and again we have to always add a pair space and only then the new token this is a standardized method to uh, include json web token into the authorization if you leave off the bearer the server will probably dump that as an invalid token just some standardized authentication uh, uh, boilerplate namings for these queries okay and then we say build and this is what gets returned into the as a request after this was intercepted if we had to do a login attempt so now let's add these uh, preferences methods press data store methods because i'm obviously missing those so we can just say we have contacts we need access into data store okay that that is for sure I'm pretty sure I don't have get JSON web token and save JSON web token, but I do have my custom class of preps data store. I don't know if you use shared preferences, but I like to use preps data store to save persistent data. I want to now copy these few functions from my already, let's say, released app with json web token so that it will be correct we just need save and get so let's go in here and we can just say so my logging incorrect okay and we have our key correctly in place like so okay now we with these and with prev's data store this is like uh, identical I mean the context is same as in shared preferences with this you can save key values and fetch key values inside of your app so it's a persistent data save and get methods okay now we have our get for our out interceptor so whenever we try to make any call we always fetch the latest de token data from our prefs data store and this class ensures it is added into our request into authorization header as a bearer token okay that's all that it does inside of our client and the save save token is in our out interceptor out authenticator interceptor because if we had to do if we received 401 this gets called 
we make a login with the credentials. If the login is actually success, we just get the JSON web token form from our from the response body and we save it back. That way we now have a new valid token always in the place. Okay. Now our client should be refreshing our privacy policy data in our cyclic methods pretty much at every 12 hours in on start method while user is using the app we ensure that our privacy policy URI gets updated with this function. Okay, cool. Now we can log if it's success. We are now in a debug mode, so it tries to update it at all times. Let's see. So now let's make a attempt to prove that our API call to refresh our privacy policy URI data is success. So there's no time limitations in debug mode. Pretty much at each on start lifecycle method, our custom function to update the privacy policy data gets called. And that's when we use our uh, retrofit API library that we just coded with those two interceptors. If our API data call response is successful and we actually get some data, for instance, new URI data, we should now be able to lock this response OK. So in here, on start as a lifecycle method gets, gets called every time, for instance, the screen rotation happens. So let's rotate a screen. So no time limitations, our app made an API call and it was able to log in and authenticate and it gave response OK. I know the back end has authentication for that endpoint, so this is valid. So let's see and manipulate this just a little bit so that we can defect this token interceptor and ensure that the login also gets called correctly. So this this way our token will never be correct because this interceptor will always fail. It will not add a valid token even though it exists now in my pref data store. And that should cause a chain of events so that this out authenticator interceptor has to intervene because my server will give unauthorized response code of 401. So we should be able to log in here what is happening. So let's reload the app right now. Okay, let's repeat that it was fast. Screen rotation, the app tried to make a privacy policy data refresh, but there was no token yet. So this interceptor intervened. We get authenticator starts logging with credentials. What else do we have inside the authenticator? Next step is authenticator login success with credentials. Okay, so we were actually able to get through all this injection fetching new refreshed values for username password and we made a post out request with those user credentials of username and password into our backend log login URI and we were able to log in successfully. Perfect. 
So both interceptors are doing their job. And of course, this was able to return that modified request with that new token. Perfect. Now let's put that actual token back so it won't be left in there and ensure that this works. We should now directly get a message that the privacy policy was updated successfully. So let me see. Updated. Yeah, each time I rotate a screen, the token gets already added and we don't make any unnecessary logging attempts with those username and password. So before we jump into the back end and see the routing with authentication, we are now successfully injecting credentials from remote configuration. We are fetching and using those credentials in our retrofit and OK HTTP API library instance classes. And we were able to make a valid login with those credentials. And then we fetched and used that JSON web token for actual API access communication requests. So we received the data that we wanted. And as long as now the token is valid, we are actually directly making those API calls with that token without the need to authenticate via locking method. Cool. Now let's jump into the KTOR and see how the authentication for JVT is set up in here. Okay, we are now inside our backend Kator framework project. And all the calls that we made from the client were assigned into our ServerDoc applications privacy policy endpoint, just to fetch the most latest up to date privacy policy page URI. Okay, one of the app related data that I want to keep in up to date. So if the authentication token was success, the app will get access into this endpoint. If not, else we rerouted the app to make a call into the login endpoint in, in this project in the back end. So this route is now guarded with that JSON web token authentication uh, method requirement. So when that failed, our interceptor stepped in because it received 401 code, unauthorized code, and the app was reroded into this login endpoint. And it used a post method and it passed user credentials inside the request body. So in here, we have to have a identical data object so that we can transform the request body into an actual coding object holding username and password. So in this post login endpoint, we will validate if the app has correct username and password. First of all, if the request body is null, we just respond unauthorized. Pretty simple. Second, if the user body object actually exists, we will check that the user username and user password are a match into our secret username and secret password. So that's, a, that's the login check 
are they valid? Are the credentials valid? Okay, if they are, we can generate a response containing that secret token, JSON Web Token. So we say JSON Web Token create with audience. Audience comes from our configuration parameters. We have defined an audience value in there. It's a string value. Issuer. Issuer comes from also from our environmental variables config and uh, it's a string value of my domain you can define those ones audience and issuer by yourself then with claim for the username and password have to be added an expiration date has to be added this is totally up to you make it valid the token can be valid for second for hour a day a week a year totally up to you and you have to add signing algorithm for that secret and we use password as the secret to generate the final token i'm just being cautious in here for the future i have added that token also into the authentic authorization heater if for any reasons i would like to fetch that also from there but the standardized way to respond a json web token is to add it as a response body so that's what i'm doing also in here so if username password was correct we will respond new token inside the response body that's all in any other case again we just respond unauthorized and the api call gets terminated because the login failed the client will not retry any more attempts unless there's another let's say timely check to try and refresh in my application and that's how pretty much this works so now our application went through the login got the J json web token response and saved the json web token and with that as long as it is valid it has an api access into the back end so that's all I wanted to show today and if you have better solutions or any questions how you should use this in your application I might be able to respond to those also in the comments but I'm interested to hear if you have any improvements for this but at least I currently do consider this as a state of the art for client authentications and the use case of considering that you never statically type your secrets in the app code but instead use so-called configuration servers to update those when needed you might be wondering how the heck did i compare the authentication from with the, uh, the request body object of username into some cryptic username and password so as i consider all of these as secrets so i can show you where they can come from but as you can see username password are queried with a keyword from an environmental variables so the server side has to hold a static reference into those secrets at least for the username and password so just something to consider in here in the server side you could statically type those inside the code or do as i do create some secrets containing environmental variable within the server maintain that and query that into your project so you get those values on the server side 
So it depends. At least the server side isn't distributed into thousand clients. So it's more secure probably have to have them statically in the code, but still use environmental variables if possible. That's how I am reaching those secrets in my login endpoint route. That's all. We'll be back.